Welcome to the Ides of Macro, where we discuss investing and trading through the lens of global macroeconomics. Grant Williams, welcome to the inaugural Ides of Macro podcast. Uh, how are you? Hey, Roger, good to see you, mate. Uh, I, I, well, I'm, I'm flattered to be the first guest on your new podcast. Thanks for having me. I was the only person we thought we'd reach out to because, you know, you've been traveling and I believe you're traveling at the moment. So uh, we're going to try and get your ideas on some of the big picture global views that you have and then maybe break down into some of the more recent uh, pieces that you've been writing. And I thought I'd just kick off with, um, you know, my, my passion is that framework is what matters to investors because a framework matters to everybody, whereas a trade idea you know, it matters to maybe one or two people. Some people can't even do them. And over the many years, I've read and watched your stuff, and it seems that most of your pieces are ideas that exist within an overall framework. Could maybe just go through what that framework is and what it is that sort of is the background and the sort of basis from which you kind of observe the world and, and then write your notes and pieces? Yeah, look, I, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to put it in terms of anything so grand as a framework. You know, I, I think over the years, um, I've just... I've been fortunate to spend an awful lot of time with an awful lot of smart people. And, um, you know, it's really just trying to learn from them how they think about things. And, and I, 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 for me, I, I, the question I'm always intrigued in asking is how uh, and then why. Whereas I think a lot of people fixate on what as the most important question. And I think that, you know, when you talk about things like frameworks, I think we all have a way of looking at the world and we all have a set of experiences that, that shape and color that way that we look at the world. Um, and so I think it's very important to listen to that, to, to, to look at the world in the way that you've, you've come to understand it rather than trying to force lessons you may have learned from other people onto, onto the world. Because it's, it's complicated, it's complex, there are no answers. And, you know, we all spend our lives... Um, trying to do the impossible basically which is which is figure out a completely unknowable future with with some degree of certainty so i think if you come at this from the position that what you're trying to do is impossible um you realize very quickly that, that the trick here is to try and eliminate mistakes and and whilst it's impossible to eliminate them what i've tried to do throughout my career is is try very very hard not to make the same mistake twice and also to to try and listen to people who explain to me mistakes they've made. Because, you know, as a, as a father of two fabulous girls who are now in their you know, late 20s and early 30s, one with kids of her own, you know, I, I, I spent an awful lot of time when they were growing up just explaining to them that it's, it's, it's okay to make mistakes, but don't make them twice. But also, you know, what they taught me was, was that, that there are things you can be taught, but there are things that you have to learn. And so I, I think, um, you know, those things that you have to learn only come through experience. And, and you could listen to the best investors in the world. You could listen to, you know, friends. You could listen to um, talking heads. And they could all tell you the same thing. Don't do this. But it's, it's the touch the stove moment. Uh, until you touch that stove, you really listen to it and think, yeah, but I'm I'm smarter than that, and I won't I won't get caught. I'll get out quick enough, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when I try and quantify a framework for me, really it begins with having a, a, a very open mind and the ability to entertain outcomes that you think are unlikely at best, and at other times outcomes that you think are highly highly unlikely, if not impossible, but at least taking the time to consider them and to consider, okay, if this were to happen, even though I think it's a 1% chance, how would that impact my portfolio? How would that impact other decisions that I've made? And what I've been you know, truly surprised about, um, both pleasantly and un unpleasantly in, in, in my own journey, if you know, creating podcasts and writing and, and, and really putting my thoughts out there for the world to kind of digest is, is how many people um, are, are absolutely unwilling to engage in the exercise of thinking about outcomes they deem to be unlikely. And, and I find that a shame, you know, and, and I've, I've always 
try to engage with those people. You know, the perfect example being, you know, you'll have a guest on a podcast and they'll say, this guy said X about Y. And as soon as I heard that, I disregarded everything else he had to say. And I just find that attitude just dreadfully short-sighted. And I understand that we all hear things every day that we think, oh, God, no, he's one of those guys. But, you know, most of all, you know, I know that as you progress through your own podcast journey with this um, Eyes and Macro project of yours, you're going to find the smartest people you can to talk to. That's, that's the whole point of these things, right? And so I know that no matter who you have on, if I disagree with something they've got to say, they didn't end up on your podcast talking to you because they're idiots. They ended up talking to you because they've got something to say and there's a, there's a value to their thinking. So yeah, I might disagree with them about, you know, the war in Ukraine or climate change or any of these topics that, that there's so much division over. Um, you know, thankfully we replaced the pandemic and the vaccine with those things. But, but having that willingness to listen and having that willingness to, to, to try and make fewer mistakes, to try and entertain all possibilities is really the best building block you can have for any kind of framework. And, and you know, I, I think when people are trying to dig into someone's framework, what they're really trying to get is a, is a give me a shortcut to thinking. Give me a way that you think that I can, I can use and I can then make the same decisions as you and be as successful as you. And I, and I just think it's a, it's a flawed pros- it's a it's a flawed flawed prospect because ultimately if i'm given the exact way that stan druckenmiller thinks i still need to apply that to my own life and my own set of decisions which are going to be entirely different to stan's so you know i, I think a framework is is such a is such a rigid sounding structure and i use the word myself all the time for for want of a better one but i think i think the key to all things investment related is flexibility. I think it's the ability to to entertain prospects that could lose you a lot of money, uh, that could cause you to be wrong and have to face that not only to yourself, but amongst your peer group. Um, and so it begins with that, you know, for, I build from the ground up, but I, I do not know the future. I have no way of knowing the future. All I'm going to be doing is trying to make the best educated guess I can. I I take as many inputs as I think are going to be useful from wherever I may find them, whether they're from people I disagree with or, or people that I don't know, but come recommended to me from people I trust. Um, I read as much about a particular subject as I can from, from kind of both sides of the political spectrum, which unfortunately we have to do these days. And it's that, it's that having that big pot to put all this information in and then having the humility to step back and say, okay, now I have all this information. How do I come at it without a conclusion that I want to find? How do I come up with an honest answer to this with some integrity that may challenge my preconceived beliefs about what the outcome is going to be? And that, I think, is the trick that we all, myself included, have to get so much better at doing is, is, is have that humility to, to recognize that no, I don't have the answer. I'm not going to get into an argument with Twitter on someone who says one thing when I think another and go, oh, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about because he has as much information as me. So that th- those are the two things, humility and flexibility, I think, for me, um, which don't sound like the, the building blocks for a framework, but I've found them to be incredibly, incredibly useful over, over a very long period of time. And, and a couple of things you said there, most, most specifically, I think, was on, on mistakes. It's something I've heard echoed before. And do you think that being able to understand mistakes and manage mistakes is more important than, in some ways than maybe picking successful, for instance, trades? So, for instance, a successful trade, great. But it's actually understanding the mistakes and managing the mistakes that will actually be more important in making sure that a long-term portfolio is successful over the, over the longer term. Yeah, look, I, think it's, I think it's really important because, look, we, we've all been right for the wrong reasons, right? We've all put trades on in the past, expecting someone to go up. How many of us are honest enough to say, well, it went up, but actually the reason I thought it was going to go up didn't actually, because something else happened. No, we're all like, yes, I got that one right. Um, But mistakes, uh, there's so much more information in a mistake 
than there is, I think, in getting something right because we're expected to get things right. You know, that's the whole reason we do what we do. We don't go into it expecting to be wrong. We, we, we go into and we commit capital. We, we invest our savings. We do things with a, you know, with a very precious resource of money and a perhaps an even more precious one in time that we expect to turn out well for us. And, and you know, as you get older and you get more experience, you, you realize that that is not always the way it happens. It doesn't mean you're an idiot. It doesn't mean you just happen to be wrong about that particular thing or early or whatever it may be. But there's, there's often not many lessons in getting things right, whereas you can always learn something, not just from your own mistakes, but from other people's. You know, if you study other people's mistakes, and that's, you know, something I'm always keen to talk about with people that I interview, is mistakes they've made and lessons they learned from them. Because, you know, it comes back to that. If, if you can learn something painful without being taught, and it's difficult, but if you can do that and you can save yourself the pain of having to learn it for yourself, great. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think mistakes are, are are incredibly incredibly important, and and as I say, having the humility to recognise your own, and also for to not pillory other people who make mistakes. You know, um, they happen, and, and and being able to learn from someone else's mistakes is um, is a rare gift in the world of social media because you know, before this. Mistakes tended to happen in the dark, in quiet rooms, and, and people kind of went away and licked their wounds and thought about what they got wrong on their own. You know, now, as part of that social media culture, people are a lot more dogmatic. They're a lot more outspoken about what they predict is going to happen in the future. And so you know, those of us who sit quietly in the weeds of social media, not kind of beating our chests and prognosticating on what is absolutely certain to happen, have the advantage to learn from from all kinds of mistakes that, that, that other people make. And do you look for, um, or do you actively court opposing views, maybe not attritionally opposing views, but challenging opposing views for yourself? Because you're always looking to see, am I right or am I wrong? Therefore, where some people push against the opposing view, do you actually actively seek it? Uh, I don't know that I actively seek it, because oftentimes you don't know where to go to get an opposing view that, that will be valuable to you, you know, because there, there's an awful lot of noise out there, which I think we all have to understand and most of us recognize by now. So seeking out an opposing view can sometimes lead you to people whose, whose thought process to come to that view is maybe not as rigorous as it ought to be if you want to use it to challenge your own feelings. So what I tend to do is uh, I look for people whose opinions I trust um, and if I can find those people who disagree with me, then so much the better. Um, but I will, I will, I will look up people who, who I know have a dog in the, any particular hunt that I'm looking at, and see what they're saying. And if they're saying the same thing as me, okay, fine. If they're saying something different, then I really, really want to understand it. And oftentimes, doing that will lead you to other people who who contradict your your thesis. And that's you know, while I don't go looking for it specifically. I'm always really happy when I find it, when I find a contradictory view from someone that I've come to naturally through my own network or through people that I've come to trust and rely on over the years, then I'm really happy. Uh, and, and, you know, oftentimes that will cause me to completely rethink what I, what I thought was going to happen. Um, sometimes I'll read it and I'll think, yep, okay, it's smart, but I just disagree with you. Um, and that's okay, but but always reading those thoughtful, considered uh, counterpoints to your own logic um, are, are incredibly useful. And so, so building a network of people that you can trust, and building a network of people whose opinions you value, whether they agree with you or not, you just but you know there's a there's a rigor to to the thought process that goes into coming out with those opinions is again it's a it's a it's an incredibly useful arrow to have in your boat and when you're actually coming up with your notes and your ideas um i mean they're they're incredibly well researched and they're almost like investigative journalism and then when i read them or when i've seen some of your pieces in in video and film format um almost operatic in that they are this narrative driven um stories which you know in the world of finance a nice deep narrative a story that you can latch on to is 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 actually quite rare. How do you go about that? It's sort of, you know, I think you're, you're a finance professional, but you, did you have a background in English and philosophy or something? How do you actually turn from no, you know, doing no. your research to a story? Yeah, no, I, I, I never had any kind of background in that stuff, but, I, but I've always, 
I've always been a great believer that that we learn through storytelling. You know, mankind has evolved on the back of storytelling. You know, the first cave paintings were stories. And I think if you can if you can tell a story, um, we're hardwired to follow that story. Uh, it has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end, and we're wired to to, to recognise those from a, from you know from when we can't even read. We, we get them read to us, you know, when we're, when we're infants. Um, and so I think if you can, if you can take a, an idea, particularly a complex idea, and you can, you can create a narrative that runs through it that people can follow, I think you can, you can explain complex ideas to, to a lot more people. And, you know, like any good story, people will jump ahead and go, ah, oh, I can see where he's going with this, which is great. Um, but I just find that, that, you know, when I used to read research when I worked at um, uh, in, in, on the investment banking side of things, I just found it very dry, and I, and you you kind of find your eyes glazing over, and you kind of flick through to the summary, and you you know you you look at the charts, and it, it just it just didn't it didn't grab you, it didn't hold you the way a story does. And I, and I think if you're trying to either explain a situation. Um, that's happening in the world of finance, or you're trying to lay out a thesis as to why the reader should do X or Y, whether it's, you know, buy this or sell that or whatever it may be. If you can take them on a journey to explain that reasoning in a, in a, in a, in a sequential manner, which, you know, for, for the most part, certainly a written story needs to be, it's tough to jump around. You can do it when you, when you make a movie out of a script, obviously, but, it tends to be sequential. And so, you know, for me, it began as a, as a way of making sure that I understood something properly. I thought, you know, if I can, if I can explain what I'm thinking here to other people in, a, in an effective manner, then it means I understand it. At least I don't have to worry about, you know, do I really understand what I'm talking about here? And so that's kind of how I started doing that. And it, and it just came very naturally to me because that's the way I like to learn about information. I like to be I like to be walked through something. I like to be able to follow a narrative and 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 understand the progression of the story and and, and see where it's going. Um, and so that's that's really what I set out to do. And, and I didn't set out to to do it for anybody but myself. It wasn't a question of um, you know thinking of, a, of an imaginary reader and thinking what does that reader need. It was really a case of I'm going to do this for myself. Uh, as a as an exercise that I think will be really useful to me, and and along the way, you know, other people found it useful uh, as well, which was which was a wonderful surprise, and and has um, has has been I- incredibly uh, joyous for me for me to go through that process over the years. And your your most recent piece, or one of your most recent pieces, you've been looking at depth into things like private equity. I'd love to get onto that, but before we do. Um, the story in private equity, it sort of follows a theme which I think you've looked at many times over the last many years, which is the multiple year buildup of things like debt, in some ways excess and maybe even we could say um, greed within the financial sector. But this um, pervading sort of essence that the world has got a little bit kind of lopsided. Um, before we look at private equity, maybe if you could just sort of go through this sort of world where it feels like, or when I read your your notes, it feels like there is this sense that things have got out of hand and things have not yet been fixed, and there is still this 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 final denouement ahead of us. What's that sort of back backdrop of of debt that kind of has always concerned you, and, and maybe that's what will lead on to our discussion on inflation later? Well, it's a really interesting question, right? Because um, this has been the story of the last. 20 years, you know, since 2008. 2008 happened because of an enormous buildup of leverage in the system. Um, and it was in the process of working itself out when policymakers realized that if we allow it to work itself out, this is going to get very, very ugly indeed. So we need to try and work it out ourselves. And the way that we can do that is really to encourage more of the same behavior. And so you know, when you when you when you think about and talk about the the excess build up in the system of, of things like leverage, um, of things like credit, of things like um, you know multiple expansion in, in, in equity markets thanks to largely passive investing, um, you realise that that this there's no real argument about what's happened. 
there's no real argument that if you look at the amount of debt in the world, it's A, much, much larger than it's ever been. B, it's grown rapidly since 2008 because of all the policies that have been put in place to deliberately encourage people to, to take on more leverage, to, to, to avoid what was beginning to happen in 2008. But by pointing that out, um, you are, as, as, as Basil Fawlty famously said, his wife Sybil's subject would be on Mastermind, stating the bleeding obvious. Um, but B, you, you can't put a timeline on this. And so what's been really interesting to watch is, is you know, when you, when you talk about these things, and we have to talk about them because they are arguably the single biggest clear and present danger to the stability of the world that we've all come to know and in many cases love. You have to talk about these things. But by talking about them, um, people will say, well, your broken clock's right twice a day and all these other things, or, you, or you've been talking about this for a while and... Yes, I have, because it's been building up for the best part of 20 years now. And so I think you have to keep talking about it. You know, if you, if you go through back through every single interview I've ever given, every single piece I've written, at no point in there will you see me either writing or saying, and all this is going to matter next Thursday, because that's when it's all finally going to come back. I have no idea when it's going to happen. I have no idea when all these things are going to matter. But I know they are. I know they have to matter at some point. And so, you know... What do you do armed with the information that there's way too much leverage in the system? Well, there are a number of things you can do with that information. Uh, you can do nothing with that information. And many people have chosen to do that. Many people have chosen that I understand that situation. I understand how perilous it is. But I'm comfortable taking on more leverage of my own, safe in the belief that if the other leverage in the system starts to give way, policymakers are going to come in and rescue it. Okay. But to take that risk on without understanding the full potential problems is a very dangerous thing to do because then you won't be the first out the door when you see you know, the signs that you're looking for that it's starting to matter. So you know, just because you recognize the problems in the system, just because you warn about how toxic and how dangerous this leverage can be, it's not saying don't do anything because the world's going to end tomorrow. And I think that's a very important distinction to make. You know, when... When the banks went in 2008, these things were leveraged, you know, 33, 40, 50 to 1. And so there were plenty of people warning about the dangers of the leverage in the banking system. And it didn't matter, it didn't matter, it didn't matter, it didn't matter. And then four or five of them ceased to exist the next day. And that's the kind of, you know, it, it was an extinction event for Bear, Bear Stearns. It was an extinction event um, for Lehman Brothers. It was almost an extinction event for Goldman Sachs and Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley. And every big name investment bank we know, it, the only reason it wasn't an extinction event was because of the government. And so understanding that and understanding how potentially catastrophic this stuff is, is hugely important. Do with it what you will. And this is why you know, this idea of a framework is, is important to understand that your own framework should just be taking in this information and deciding what you personally need to do with it, if anything. Uh, but not understanding the risks and not understanding how catastrophic it will be should these risks overwhelm the people currently charged with keeping them at bay is dereliction of duty in my, in, in my, in my belief. So you can find any number of Wall Street analysts who will tell you, every possible reason why everything's going to keep going up forever because that's their job right understand why they make their living they are there to sell a story as are cnbc and fox business that sunshine and roses will rain things are going to go up you can buy equities today i get it all it's absolutely fine and they're going to be right for so many days and then one day they won't be like 2008 and an awful lot of people who weren't completely in possession of the facts about what the potential dangers were will get wiped out and it doesn't matter if you've made money for you know five years straight if you lose it all in that sixth year not only are you back to the start again you're in a much worse position because mentally now you've had the experience of losing everything and that will change the entire way you look at the business of investing the business of saving so you know i think it's really important to understand these risks and and to talk about them um 
in the understanding that there may not be something for you personally to do today, but at least be aware that this at some point is going to be a problem and have a plan for it and, and have a way to gauge when it's becoming more pressing. It's, uh, I guess it's one of those things where as long if you're armed with the knowledge of the worst case scenario, then you know, you're forewarned about it. And then it always reminds me that this is always slow burning. And then like that, um, the Oscar nominated film, then it's everywhere, everything, everywhere, all at once. Before that, it's nothing. And then suddenly exactly. yeah, everything exactly. pops in one go. Yeah. Um, and and within this, you know, one, I think, you know, what you've talked about and we can come on to the bit on private equity now, because it feels like what's happened over the last 15 years is 2008 was it was a banking crisis in particular and the pseudo banking crisis. And the regulation since then has, um, rather than exterminated the risk, it's shifted it towards the asset management or the, you know, the, the wealth accumulators, hence the passives, hence the private equity. It feels like all that's happened is that banks got a slap on the risk. Some went under, some were effectively given a lifeline until you can't take that sort of risk anymore. So all the market making discs all spun out and became quasi hedge funds or arms of hedge funds. Yeah. And um, and the risk takers now became, you know, asset managers, as we saw with the near um, catastrophe in the UK with with the gilt market. And OK, the banks were sort of implicit yep. and, and complicit in that in September of 2022. But it feels like this has become and a lot of your writings have become about the risks now inherent within the asset management industry. And all that's happened is we've just seen a shift a regulation in banks and not enough regulation in asset managers. So now it's it's the risk now is with the pension funds and pensions. And this is where it's about private equity, because private equity has sort of stepped into this breach to promise things which are great on a mark to market basis, but maybe on a mark to reality basis. There's still that very much the risks that were pre 2008 are still there, but just in you know, different sheep with different wolves clothing, as it were. Yeah. What, what is it? What is that issues that you now see that you wrote so, so sort of eloquently about in terms of the private equity space now? Well, well, I think look, private equity is the perfect example of what we've just been talking about. Right. Um, if you if you ask people if they're aware of private equity, they will say to you, oh, yeah, I know private equity has been doing really well these last you know, number of years. I, you know, I keep hearing about how how much money guys in private equity are making and these, you know, the, the listed private equity funds have traded really high and. Everyone's moving to private equity. And so you get this sense of, of how well private equity has been doing. And that's fine because it's absolutely correct. But once you start digging into it and you say to yourself, OK, but I want to understand why private equity has been doing so well. Why has private equity been ubiquitous? Why has it done so well? Why are so many articles get written about it? Why are so many pension funds putting assets into private equity? When you ask that question, instead of just taking it as read that private equity has done really well, you start to go down that rabbit hole and you start to find a story. And, and, you know, this is one that's not going to be unfamiliar with people, but perhaps they hadn't thought of it in a private equity context. And so, you know, when you realize what this nailing of interest rates to the floor has done, it's been a huge tailwind for private equity because it's forced all these pension funds into looking for the kind of returns that private equity offers. It's given private equity access to massive amounts of essentially free capital to do what they do, buy things and lever them up and strip them and sell them. And, you know, everything in private equity, the, the, the sole reason really, or the, certainly the, 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 the main reason behind private equity success has been zero interest rate policy, period. That's it. And so when, when you understand that, as opposed to just, oh, private equity is doing really, really well lately, you then start to ask yourself, well, okay, what difference does it make now that rates are not zero anymore, now that rates are at 4%? What difference does that make to private equity? And you know what, when you take a look, it makes a lot of difference to private equity, right? It suddenly makes private equity not the only game in town. And, and so you find yourself with a whole corner of the financial complex that has taken a significant amount of money in has it locked up for multiple years hence in a period where a lot of these pension funds who were stretching to reach their seven percent yields can now probably get that with some well-chosen corporate debt that isn't locked up and so everything has changed in the private equity world everything now 
if interest rates get nailed to the floor again, okay, do things go back to normal? Possibly. It's another question to ask. But if the reality is, which I suspect it may be, that while rates have tried to go up, they've wanted to go down for an, you know, the last 10, 15 years, because that's the natural path, I think that's changed. And while rates may temporarily go down, the natural path for them is now going to be higher for the next period of time. That changes everything for private equity. And private equity capital is incredibly illiquid. You know, we saw a whiff of this. If anyone was paying attention, they saw CalPERS sold a big chunk of their private equity assets at a, I forget, I think it was a 20% discount uh, several months ago to get them off their books. They saw the writing on the wall. Um, and so... You know, when you look at something like private equity, who are essentially charged with creating their own marks, they don't have to mark stuff to market until they sell it. Um, and you dig further into the story and you find that they're creating vehicles which allows them to sell big chunks of their assets to themselves at higher valuations. Um, you know, they own 100% of an asset, they spin it out into a new vehicle, they buy 20% of it themselves and they bring a lot of other people in. Um, but they've essentially shipped 80% of it off their books. They've made their management fees. They, they, you know, all the things they're incentivized to do for themselves get taken care of, and some investor somewhere is going to be left holding the bag. It's a very different story. And so to say private equity has done really, really well, and that's likely to continue in a very, very different world, is a dangerous assumption to make. And so do I think private equity is all going to go to zero tomorrow? Of course not. But do I think that at the margin, there are plenty of big, big, big pools of capital that have money tied up in private equity now uh, who could get 5% for zero risk and could juice that to 10% with very, very little risk and meet their 7% hurdle rates quite comfortably? Yes. The question is, what are they going to do about that? Are they going to try and lean on private equity to to help them exit these positions. Are they going to do what CalPERS did and have a fire sale? We don't know. But 5% interest, uh, interest rates for zero risk changes an awful lot about the way an awful lot of people think, from individuals to, to companies to hedge funds to pension funds. And that will not happen in a vacuum. Um, and so private equity is the perfect example of this. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a story that is still unfolding. It's a story that I suspect will be very different going forwards to how it looks looking back at it. And it's something people need to be aware of, even if there's nothing to do particularly for them right now. They need to understand if this private equity business starts to suffer, what are the knock-on effects? What dominoes topple outside private equity that might end up in my lap? And in terms of the, the process and the thinking process for a lot of pension funds, I guess, is that um, when we look at particularly the sort of more public pension funds, they're still significantly underwater versus where they need, need to be, I, still unfunded um, or not fully funded. And that's with, I guess, these private equity marks still at these elevated levels, which, as CalPERS might suggest, is at exactly. least 20 percent too high. And then the problem, I guess, is that, as you said, these are liquid and it's everyone always talks about, you know, talking about the peak in the market, etc. But the idea of just shifting a billion, two billion, even in a liquid public market, can have such a significant downward impact at the margin on prices that this concept of, you know, I don't know how many trillions there are now into the private equity world, but it's a, it's a significant comparison even to the overall public markets. There is no way we can have a seamless shift in regime from people going, oh, I want out of private equity into public market credits, et cetera, et cetera. So those unfunded liabilities in this whole regime shift, shift potential probably widen out just because it's impossible to move this sort of money. Yeah, and, and and God forbid you want to do it at the same time everybody else is trying to do it. Uh, because, you know, the, the people forget because they spend so much time in liquid markets, the idea of a bidless market doesn't really ring true with most people. They, they just expect every day there's going to be a bid. And if you're looking to get rid of your Apple shares or your Microsoft shares or your Netflix shares, there is. There's always going to be a bid for you. You may not like it, but it won't be egregious different story altogether with private equity and, and if everybody comes through the doors looking to sell you know th this is what a bank run looks like right it, it's not a bank run but if you if you ever seen the famous um Henri Cartier Bresson pictures of the bank runs in Shanghai back in the 1930s and you see this just amazing crowd of people just crushed together just a, a wall of faces each face telling 
a different story of desperation to get their money out of the bank, you you know you realize what happens when these things finally topple over. So um, you know again, understanding it is the first step. Uh, understanding whether it could possibly ripple through to your own portfolio, even if you have no private equity, is the second step. And then figuring out if you have to do anything about it right now or, or at least come up with a plan for the future so you're ready to act if certain things happen is the third step. And, and it, it doesn't need to get more complicated than that at a macro level. And do you think that the assumption that a lot of investors have taken, particularly after 2008, where... Yeah, a couple of, yeah, in the UK, we saw Northern Rock go, as you said, Bear Stearns, Lehman. And then eventually the policymakers stepped in and said, well, that's enough. And suddenly moral hazard returns. Moral hazard was being dealt with and then it returns. And in this scenario, again, we've got you know, more recently retail have come into the private equity space but encouraged in. But let's say that retail want to leave and that will have a mark to market impact. Most I think there's a lot of investors just take the view from 2008, which is if it starts getting that bad, policymakers will once again step in and they'll say, OK, it's better to have three billion of retail locked in and they can't get their money for three years rather than have everything's come out at the same time and not only wipe out the private equity market, but also wipe out the public market. Isn't it better just to maintain moral hazard and let the fat cats remain being well paid and keep on protecting them just because you know, the overall impact, as you say, the potential that everything everywhere all at once moment would be so horrific that policymakers will step in again, big, too big to fail. Yeah, look, that is that. That's not only a possible outcome, but given all the evidence of the last couple of decades, that's a very likely outcome. At least right up until the point where they implement that policy, where they say, "Okay, it's bailout time, boys. Here we go. Get the checkbooks out." Now, my contention would be that this time there is. A, I won't say this time is different, but there is an additional variable here which complicates that particular response significantly, and that's inflation. Um, we didn't have it when the checkbooks came out last time. It wasn't a, a danger at that time. It is now. And you know, if, if you've been paying attention to central banks in the last year or so, and, and, and they've, they've kind of increased the forcefulness of what they've said as each month has gone by, they are very serious in terms of their understanding that they need to choke um, inflation off and they cannot allow inflation to get out of hand and they've been they've been desperate for everybody to believe them um and obviously there's a lot of learned behavior there and so markets aren't necessarily taking them at their word and they're not doing what the fed hoped they would do and the the other central banks so uh i suspect that there there is a, a an awakening down the road somewhere for people who realize oh you know we do have a moment not necessarily the collapse of private equity or you know anything as dramatic as that. But what if markets go down 25% and there's no sign of the central banks riding to rescue? And in fact, they're still talking about how we have to be vigilant about inflation. And, you know, inflation is our primary concern. Um, if that happens and people suddenly have this realization that actually maybe this famous Fed put down 20% isn't there anymore, the next step of that process is, yikes, okay, well, let me look at my portfolio. Uh, and when you do that and you realize the valuations you own your portfolio on and you think about, okay, what do those valuations look like over the next five years if interest rates are going to stay and the discount rate is going to stay at this level? Your portfolio looks very, very different to you. It looks exactly the same as it did the day before. But your worldview has changed. Your understanding of the likely policy moves may have changed. And most importantly, I think people need to understand the likely success of any attempt by central banks to use the policies they've used before in terms of lowering interest rates and negative rates and all the things they've used, the likelihood of success of those policies, similar success they've had, is much lower, I think. And what that probably means is we get far more coercive policies like yield curve control, like mandated holdings of you know, sovereign securities in pension funds, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, all of which undermines confidence in markets. So there, there are, you know, in my view, there are 25 ways this can go horribly, horribly wrong. And there's two or three, if at best, where it could go horribly right. Um, and, and, you know, I'm struggling to think of two of those three, to be honest with you. And if that's the case 
what do you, what's your thought process for that? If, if there is one way, realistically, that this can go right, i.e. the playbook that's worked so well in the past, they use again and it works again, despite the fact that inflation's here, despite the fact that people um, are locking money up in T-bills and, and two-year treasuries and staying out of markets. If that's your positive outcome, and there are numerous ways when you could see a, uh, an outcome that's incredibly damaging to your portfolio, well, there you go. There's a decision you have to make. Here's where a framework comes in. Um, what do I do about that? Do I trust that everything will be okay because it always has been for the last 20 years and do nothing? Okay. If that's your considered opinion after at least taking the time to think it through, go with God. If you realize that this is a very different world and there is much more danger to me here, I need to do something about it, great. Start thinking that through. It probably means you're going to have some things to try and sell. And it probably means you're going to have some things you want to sell before other things that you might want to sell. And you better prioritize those and get rid of the ones that could really hurt you sooner rather than later. Thank your lucky stars that you've been gifted 10 years of essentially straight line returns. Um, say thank you. Take your chips off the table. Stick them in, you know, a, a two-month CD at 5%, which you can get now. And wait. And be patient. And wait for the, for the all-clear siren to go off, the air raid to stop. And then come out, blinking into the sunlight, and start again. Okay, what does this new world look like? Well, what can I invest in now that's appropriate for me and, and gives me the requisite amount of risk that I'm looking for? Um, it's a constantly evolving problem. Uh, and, and, and a big, big, big part of that is what can go wrong? Risk management. What can go wrong and how badly will it hurt me if it does? You know, risk management is everything. Um, trusting that everything will be fine and I'll be able to get out if it goes wrong is a guaranteed way to the poorhouse. One of the things I've found most fascinating over this last two or three year period is that at the end of the last decade, so 2019, it felt like um, we were going into an ever decreasing world of opportunity, no growth, more and more debt. We'd come to the end of the whole QE uh, monetary kind of phenomenon of central banks and that we were about to have this sort of default event sometime in the near future. Then we had the exogenous shocks, COVID, Ukraine, etc. And now we've had inflation. If you were to talk to me in 2018, I'd have said that this whole scenario can only keep going if we don't have sudden inflation. Inflation is a thing that kills it. What I found really fascinating, particularly over the last nine months, is that the number of people now who are actually become optimistic because of inflation, whereas before everyone was pessimistic that inflation would kill the debt demographic nightmare that we're all in. And now suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, we've got some growth. Now we've got the growth. Oh, I can see how we can grow out of this. Now, do you think that that is people like to be optimistic? Or do you think that is, for instance, one thing I've sort of argued is that we had a price shock last year. We're now in this transition window before the policy response has actually kicked in, before we've actually really experienced what it is truly to be in a higher inflation, um, higher interest rate world. So things feel good because we've not got into the shock bit yet. We're still, we're not, we're not into the growth shock bit yet. We're just coming out of the price shock bit. And it's that nominal growth again, a little bit of real growth with it. But do you, have you got any sense of that? Because I've got this sort of pervading sense that now everyone's looking at inflation really positively, whereas three years ago, it was going to kill us. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, th I think the best thing people can do is go to the library and, and check out all the books on how wonderful it was in the 1970s. It, you shouldn't have to carry too many home with you. You know, we had real inflation in the 70s. And it's really hard to find anything good about the 70s. The only thing I've managed to find was Fulham got to the FA Cup final in 1975, but we got beaten by West Ham. So that, that was a downer. Um, so, yeah, look, you're absolutely right. We're in that sweet spot where people go, well, hang on a second, we get some growth. It, it, it marginalizes the debt. We can pay our debt off in devalued you know, currency. And this is great. Yeah, OK. But it hasn't fed through to wages properly yet. Those, it's, it's happening. That hasn't got embedded in the system yet. It's happening. Uh, this time we've got onshoring coming through, which is going to raise the cost significantly. Um, and that's not going to be a choice, I think, for a lot of people. They're, they're going to be forced to bring things back onshore. We are very much in that sweet spot. And I think that's why people 
believe that, well, inflation is going to moderate and we all know the base effects are going to drop out. And yes, it will moderate. Um, but if something goes up 10% year over year and the next year only goes up 3%, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's not gone back to where it was a year ago. Everything is still much higher. It's the rate of change that's slowing down here. And while the headline number might encourage people to think, oh, inflation's under control, the interesting thing now is that everyone has their own sense of inflation. And it's not, it's not become an abstract concept. It, 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 it's real, right? And, and you know, I'm, I'm here in Sydney to visit my, my daughter. Um, and she was telling me at lunch today, she said, oh, you know, we've, 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 some friends of hers are here and, and they're here on kind of backpacking visas, which are coming back now in Australia. And they've been working in, in uh, the restaurant she manages. You know, she, she got jobs for them for a few months. And they're being forced to leave because they can't afford. They're like, we can't afford to stay here. It's just so expensive. Um, and it's one anecdotal story. But, you know, you see people at the grocery store now checking prices on things in, 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 the, in, the, in the yogurt section, right? And they're, and they're buying cheaper yogurts. And people are noticing that packaging smaller and this this mindset around inflation is really starting to stick with people now it's becoming entrenched and people understand they're in a higher cost world and at the moment we're in the kind of complaining about it stage um which you know is mingled in with the uh, the government aligning to a stage which anyone that follow who follows these numbers for a living knows has been the case for 50 years but you know suddenly it's becoming apparent to people that don't follow it for a living, which is which is a good thing. Um, and that soon becomes the behavior change phase where, okay, we don't buy Coke anymore. We buy the supermarket's own brand cola, which you know was every kid's nightmare in the in the nineteen seventies when mum came home with panda pops, right? Um, that's just the reality of it. It's human behavior. And human behavior doesn't change over time, right? So so if, if you understand that cycle and, and how it metastasizes, then you get a better sense of where we are. And, and what you've said is absolutely correct. At the moment, we're in the, well, a little bit of inflation. They've been trying to get it for such a long time. So if we have 8% inflation for six months, then it moderates to two. That's probably quite a good thing, right? Because they've essentially got four years of 2% inflation out the way in one go and everything's coming back. No, it doesn't work that way. And and we're we're still not factoring in i think at the base level the ways in which the world has changed the world is not going back to what it was pre-pandemic it just isn't and one day maybe it does but it's not going to happen in the foreseeable future and that means we have to change the way we think about the world and if, if we change the way we think about the world then it very much changes the way we invest our money and and that's the bit i think that people around the edges are starting to come to terms with and are starting to, 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 to create plans for. Um, and the more and more people that realize that, the more and more people that understand that this inflation mindset is not going anywhere and, and strikes are going to continue because people, people don't want more money in their pay packets. They need it now. And so these strikes are born not out of greed, but out of necessity. And, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of intervention when it comes to striking. And that's, that's a huge problem. Um, and it's one we're going to have to get used to, I think. Do you think people are, um, what we're talking about here is that the reaction to inflation is always the same because there's a lot of discussion about the type of inflation. And, and I, I have argued that the yep. 1970s was the end of a 40-year period with almost institutionalised systems allowed inflation because of trade unionism, et cetera, plus the shock, oil shocks of that decade versus the 1940s, which was more supply shocks, et cetera. Um, and a lot of people sort of argue, okay, it's, you know, the, the people who, who complain the most about inflation, people like me and you who were in the 1970s, where the UK in particular was also mismanaged. So there's this double shock. And I remember, even though it's at the beginning of my life, I've still never experienced a decade as weird as the 1970s. Maybe being a young kid is always weird. But it's sort of there's this argument that, yeah. you know, today, the inflation today can't be as embedded as the 1970s, because that was the end of a, a, a whole framework which institutionalized it. Today, it might go high, but then it'll come back down low. And again, the Pavlovian conditioning is even in the 1940s. We saw these three spikes, as we saw in the 1960s and 70s. So everyone's worried that we're going to get consecutive spikes. But let's just say we look back in three years' time, and it went up and it came down, and it was back. And OK, it rebases at three or four, 
but let's say it oscillates between two and five rather than zero and two. When we look back and say, that's okay, or is it a case of, you know, we end up, yes, it's at five, but actually, you know, our interest rates, our yields, and maybe our bank accounts are only at two, so we get, particularly savers, get financial repression. But maybe for the younger generation, a world where you've actually got growth, you've got investment, you've got less, fewer buybacks, you've got more being put into developing commodities, etc. Actually, for the non-retirement generation, the young generation, that could be a good world, not a bad world. Yeah, look, it's, it sounds like a fantastic world for, for a lot of people. Um, but let's talk about it in practical terms, because that younger generation, um, as we move into that, that world you've just described, they're also moving into their getting married, buying houses, having kids years. And, you know, for, for those years to be, for that world you've just described to be comfortable for them um, and, to, and to be a world that they can thrive in, you know what the first thing that has to happen is the housing market has to get cut in half. That's it, right? That's that's the first thing that has to happen for that world to be the world that we remember and we would like to give to our kids. The housing affordability simply has to get dramatically improved. And look, the only way that's going to happen is the prices come down because the wages are not going to go up to meet the cost of housing. Um, and you know, there's an awful lot of ink spilled about the housing market. You know, I've been talking about it for a long, long time now because it's so integral to all this, this whole puzzle. You know, to the, the, the boomers and the Gen Xers have gotten rich by just buying houses and buying investment properties in an era of declining rates. And it's pushed the price up beyond the affordability of the generations you just spoke about. So if we do want 2% inflation to or five percent inflation to create a world that works for those guys interest rates are going to have to be positive you know which means interest rates of six percent which is going to create all kinds of financial turmoil but it will do enough to bring house prices down you know that those house prices will come down if we have mortgage rates uh, double digits prices will come down you know the first house i bought my mortgage rate was 12 percent but you know what I only had to borrow $50,000 to buy that house. So the payments were perfectly affordable. Um, and that's the world, if we're going to get back to one that's going to work for younger generations, that, that gives them a real chance of building um, uh, a stable family, a stable base for their retirements. The things that are going to happen, or have to happen, sorry, are going to, are going to penalize generations that, that, frankly, are the ones that should give something back. So this, this idea of redistribution of wealth is a real one. It's an important one. And it needs to happen. The question is, can it happen peacefully? Or does it happen either violently or in a, as a result of confiscation? Or does it happen because of pure turmoil? I, I don't know. But mankind has a, has a very good way of, of redistributing these things and, and getting back to the natural order of things. And so I suspect one of those things is going to happen. What, what, I, what I can't see happening, and I won't say it won't happen because anything could happen. What I can't see happening, and I think it's the longest shot, is we get this kind of Goldilocks scenario that everyone's praying for, where house prices gently drift lower and incomes gently rise and inflation gently eases away some of the debt and we get to this world that works for everybody. It could buy our world. I just don't see that happening. Um, you know, as I say, I don't give it a zero percent chance because, hey, it could. But I think it's the least likely outcome, and so it's the, it's the one I spend least amount of time thinking about preparing for. And then, just sort of coming full circle, um, thinking kind of forwards a little bit into that sort of framework concept again, but. Everyone frets over things like the Fed pivot, but actually, I think you interviewed Howard Marks, or you, you talked about one of the sort of concepts he was talking about, which is the pivot's kind of irrelevant. What matters is what your view is for the next 10 years worth of growth. Do you get a sense just from yourself or from others, the growth that we get over the next 10 years, will it be high in nominal terms, but low in real terms? Will it be much more volatile or will we just get no growth because of all these headwinds? What What's your sense? Because if someone could tell me the type of growth we get, I'd say that's probably more important for my portfolio than knowing what Fed policy is going to be for the next 10 years. Where, where do you get a sense for that, that growth you know, for the next 10 years? I think it's a great point, Roger. I, 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 can, I think we can expect higher nominal growth. 
Um, but I struggle to see that translating uh, into higher real growth. You know, we're, we're in this kind of muddle through phase, as my friend John Morden called it for so many years now, and he was absolutely right. We've kind of muddled through. Um, you know, I've, I'm, I'm not sure where the Atlanta now forecast is, but it was up in the high sixes, low sevens last time I saw it for, for, for US GDP, which is great nominally. Um, but if you start getting, you know, 8% GDP prints and, and some of the other data prints, you, you're, you're looking at a basket case economy. And I, and I just don't think that's healthy for anybody. Um, and of course, if we start getting 8% nominal growth, it's going to force the Fed's hand into the kind of action that that nobody invested in markets is hoping they get forced into doing. So, look, it, it's the next period. I don't want to say the next number of years or months. I don't know how long it's going to be. But this next period, and we have moved into a new period here. This is a very different world. Is going to be the trickiest period to invest in for most of our lifetimes. Right? I mean, there are there are there are most people in the financial industry began their careers after 2008. There are, there are entire trading desks that, that have, have not traded markets before 08. Go back to 2000, there's a very small number of people in the industry who were, you know, relatively, who were around and experienced the times before that. Get back to, you know, the, the, the 90s, the, the, the Japan bull market, 87 crash, and it's only dinosaurs like me who, who were around and remember those things. Um, what we've had in this last 20 years has been the easiest investment environment. And even though the world's been beset by troubles, um, it's been a phenomenally easy environment to invest in. You've just had to buy stuff and sit tight and trust the Fed to bail you out. That's, that's not going to be the case anymore. And so I think people need to understand that and realize that there are an awful lot of people out there who have made a lot of money by investing and i use that word in term inverted commas it's basically buying and holding who probably think they are incredibly well equipped for what comes next um and they may be but i think they need to do some real soul searching uh listen to experienced guys and listen to how concerned they are about how difficult this environment is getting and is becoming and ask themselves look if this guy if howard marks is concerned about the world we're going into, should I be concerned? And the answer is most likely, yes, you damn well should be. And so what are you going to do about it? And that's the question you need to sit and down and ponder. So basically people should be actively, let's say people have been on that old mindset, people should actively pursue understanding this potential new mindset because it might be a difficult environment, but if you are prepared to be nimble, be active and recalibrate your outlook, Actually, it could work out quite well. It's just if you remain locked into the old mindset and think that that should just last forever, then this will be a very tricky world. Yeah, you, look, you, it's, it's, not, it's not that you necessarily have to learn new tricks, which we can all do. You, know, you can always learn new things. The problem is you're going to have to unlearn a lot of things that have become ingrained in everything you've learned through your entire time investing and trading in these markets. You're going to have to unlearn that stuff because if you don't unlearn that, and your default isn't, well, everything I've learned suggests Fed's going to pivot, market fall a bit, everyone come in, here's what happened, market go, I'll be fine. You have to unlearn that. And that's not an easy thing to do. It really isn't. Um, but the sooner you do it, the sooner you come at this with fresh eyes and, and a broader landscape of understanding of the possible outcomes, the better off you're going to be in the long run. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, because I actually always learn something when I'm listening to you or reading your stuff. So uh, hopefully I will be in the, the latter category rather than the former. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Uh, brilliant to talk to you. Um, thanks for, for joining us. And uh, I hopefully we'll do this again sometime because always good to, to hear your thoughts. Anytime, Roger. And best of luck with the podcast. I'm, uh, you, you and the other guys that like you and have done a fantastic job. And, you know, I, obviously I know you are personally, you're all fine, fine gentlemen, and I, and I wish you the very best of luck. And if I can help with it in any way, you know where I am. Thanks very much. See you, mate. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you. Cheers.